by Captain Cook in December 1777 and now Britain's nuclear testing base in the Pacific. Most of the supplies arrive by sea. Ships anchor off the entrance to the lagoon and are offloaded by landing craft to bring to the island the heavy stores and materials for Grapple Y, the fifth British test in the Megaton range. The landing craft bring their cargoes ashore at Port London, the port for the islands long before the task force came. Bulky cargoes include these prefabricated sections for new workshops and living quarters to be constructed during the trial. A colony of natives still live in their village at Port London. Gilbert is brought here generations ago to work the coconut plantations, for these were the island industries. Some of the Gilbertees now work for the task force. The coconut plantations are still on the island, although a few palm trees have been cleared to allow task force installations to be constructed. Many much needed improvements have been made in the living accommodation since the previous trials in 1957. Tents are now of the type used for field hospital work and are far more comfortably equipped and furnished. Before Grapple Y, the Royal Engineers started to tarmac some of the roads which were carrying the heaviest traffic. The plant was constructed for the production of the material, a mixture of bitumen, cement and crushed coral aggregate. The coral was quarried on the island. The tarmac was carried by lorry from this plant to a road laying machine. By this means, the road from the airfield to the main camp was surfaced as were roads within the camp area. Buildings for scientific groups have also been constructed by Royal Engineers, assisted by a company of Fijian soldiers. The majority of the buildings are only of a semi-permanent nature, but meet as far as practicable the requirements of service and civilian technicians. A flight of six hours from Honolulu by Hastings aircraft brings to an end the journey of new arrivals to the island. Passengers are welcomed at the airfield and taken by bus to the main camp about four miles away where the majority of them will live for the duration of the trial. Administrative staff have already allocated them their tents at the camp and after settling in the newcomers can go to the mess, only recently completed and a great improvement on the tented mess used in 1957 a rest in the anteroom and a drink at the bar. Sixpence for whiskey, eightpence for soft drink, so it pays to drink spirits. This is an introduction to the life of the island. The kitchen is separate from the dining room and all meals have to be ferried across. Catering is by RAF personnel. Settling in means unpacking, and unpacking means washing dirty clothes. There are no wives to do your washing on Christmas Island and it's hard work for the uninitiated. Never mind, the weather's fine and the clothes should dry quickly in the breeze from the sea. Swimming is a favourite relaxation and the port is a popular place. In spite of the heat, the British must play football. In fact, an island league has been formed among the services. This is the church, building in native style, the Paris Church of St Nicholas, and now being enlarged by voluntary labour.
A furnished tent can be made comfortable to live in and pleasant to sleep in after a long journey or hard day's work. The day can begin with a rainstorm. The island is only two degrees north of the equator and the weather is variable and almost unpredictable. A maximum of six inches of rain has been recorded in one day and this kind of weather can play havoc with equipment and can delay essential preparations. The floods will soon go down and the island will roast in the sun a few hours later, but gear unprotected and liable to flooding can be ruined. Life can be uncomfortable in the wet on Christmas Island. Unlike the men, the crabs don't mind the weather. Many could do with a wash and they have their own peculiar way of bathing. The rough tracks and roads suffer most, for the surface can be washed away and badly potholed. The roads are rough anyway for journeys into the forward area 14 miles from the camp. Vehicles suffer badly under these conditions. Land Rovers are good, but they take a terrific hammering. Helicopters are used to transport personnel and delicate equipment to the forward positions. They are invaluable, saving both damage and time. This helicopter is landing for loading at D site, where Royal Engineers are preparing the instrumentation shelters. Corrugated aluminium with sandbag reinforcement protects the contents of this steel shelter from the effects of the explosion. The average day temperature is over 80 degrees and this together with the humidity, makes manual labor extremely strenuous and tiring. But the engineers did a good job and were usually very cheerful. The technical services group of AWRE work in close liaison with the army during the erection of scientific buildings. While instruments within the shelter have to be protected, apparatus to transmit information to these instruments must be exposed. This is sea site. The Kingstrand buildings are used for laboratories, workshops and for storage. Sea site is the most important of the forward positions and is the location of the scientific control room for the operation. These aerials are for VHF communication with the aircraft which drops the weapon and for the reception of telemetry signals from the weapon before release and up to the moment of explosion. Equipment for measuring the heat flash is installed on top of the shelter by the thermal measurements group. These boxes must be accurately aligned to the point of the explosion. Cameras at sea site must also be lined up with the planned position of burst, which is at a high altitude a few miles off the southeastern tip of the island. Inside the shelters, the wiring of electrical and electronic circuits proceeds to a planned program. Instrumentation relies on electronics and on specialized equipment designed for the purpose. Data is to be recorded for analysis after the trial. Equipment failures must not happen on D-Day. The climatic conditions so near to the equator create another problem. Shelters and laboratories are fitted with air conditioning plant to remove excess humidity, which after a rainstorm is in the region of 90 percent. This extremely high moisture content can be judged from this trough of water removed from air within a shelter. As work in the forward area nears completion, protective shields are fitted and additional reinforcing struts are welded to the shelters. Inside the control room, wiring is nearing completion on the many complex systems which will operate cameras and recording instruments. Forward control is the brain center of the operation on D-Day, which will be the 28th day of April. Seasite also provides accommodation and meals for those personnel who choose to live in the forward area. They have more mosquitoes and flies there, but most of the residents reckon that they are better off than at the main camp. The air and ground shock measurements team are installing one of their frequency modulated tape recorders in the instrument lane. Twelve of these recorders are used at predetermined positions. 
The tape is started by a clockwork time switch and the beginning of the recording is indicated by the flash of the weapon. The recorder is tested after installation by means of an ordinary photo flash bulb. The task of the group is to measure the pressure time characteristics of the shock wave. After testing the recorder, the cover is placed into position. When the cover is closed, the lid of the container is fixed by means of side clamps. Finally, the site is cleared and levelled ready for the explosion on D-Day. These high-speed cameras on a camera bed at A-Site belong to the photographic measurements group and are protected from the heat and blast by fiberglass cowling. Generators maintained by the Royal Engineers provide the electric power required on the island. At the Joint Operations Centre, the generator installation runs under normal conditions. This plant generates enough power to supply an English village. In the forward area, however, it is a different story. Generators supplying power to shelters must be protected by sandbagging from the immediate effects of the explosion. Switch gear outside the shelters must be similarly protected. The sandbags are cement washed as an added protection against the weather and against the heat of the explosion. It will soon be D-Day and on the airfield all the machines are lined up to be finally prepared for their sorties. The four Valiants of 49 Squadron have arrived from England and one of them has been selected to drop the weapon. Final servicing and routine checks are made in the engine bay. Four Rolls-Royce Avons to each aircraft. All flying surfaces are checked. Instrumentation is prepared inside the fuselage. These are the Canberra sampling aircraft at dispersal. They have been coated with a barrier paint to facilitate decontamination after their flight through the explosion cloud. Ground crew are at work on the Canberras preparing to fit cloud sampling equipment to the underside of the fuselage. Immediately after the burst on D-Day, whirlwind helicopters will carry re-entry parties into the forward area and one will fly on a seawater sampling sortie to ground zero. The long-range Shackletons are used for meteorological flights and sea searches. On D-Day, one will carry a cameraman to photograph the explosion from the air and another will make a flight downwind of the explosion to check that there has been no fallout. It is D-1, Sunday the 27th of April. Activity on the island decreases as the work completed reports come in from the scientific groups. Only the last minute jobs have now to be finished off. At sea site, Cameras are loaded in readiness to photograph the explosion. The accommodation tents are removed in readiness for the blast wave which will sweep across the area some seconds after the flash. Back at the base area, the permanent structures are vented to allow the blast to pass through without causing damage. This is a major job that must be carried out before the drop, but which can only normally start the evening before. In the smaller buildings, it only involves the removal of windows, internal partitions and doors. The buildings have been modified so that this can be done as easily as possible. There is a multitude of duties to be carried out by aircraft in addition to actually carrying and dropping the weapon. Shackletons of 204 and 265 squadrons will be in the air for days before the tests begin and continually while they progress. Survey and reconnaissance. Search and patrol. Back on the airfield, the Valiant chosen to carry the weapon is towed to the bombing up apron. She is all ready for her cargo. Canvas screens have been placed around the aircraft for security purposes and behind them the bomb doors are opened and the weapon hoisted in.
summed up, she is under close guard throughout the night. Sunrise on the 28th. Engines are starting on the airfield as Shackleton's prepare to take off on weather flights and on sea searches. Inside the operations center, all aircraft are plotted in their positions around Christmas Island and in the test area. For every aircraft has its own predetermined position in the sky. 170,000 square miles of the Pacific have been searched continually for days to make sure that no unscheduled ships or aircraft are anywhere within this area. It is a monotonous job, but an essential part of the operation. All aircraft must be in the air to avoid blast damage. The Shackletons have already left, followed by the Canberras, four of which have been briefed to take samples of the cloud. Island Tower, this is Kilo Mike 22. Request permission to start engines, over. Kilo Mike 22, uh, your permission to start engines, over. Kilo Mike 22, your permission to start engines, over. Christmas Island Tower, this is Kilo Mike 22. Request taxi clearance, please, over. Uh, 22, you're afraid of taxi, uh, one way zero eight. Uh, one zero two four. Kilo Mike 22, roger. One zero two four. Valiant XD-824 is airborne and gathering flight. Radar at X site tracks the aircraft towards the target area. man in the Shackleton circling the target area. The fireball is now beginning to cool and the mushroom stem is developing. An ice cap is gradually forming in the air pushed ahead of the cloud as it rises. 
and a condensation column is developing in the moist atmosphere underneath the stem. are now waiting for the blast wave to arrive. It strikes buildings at the airfield. A Canberra sampling aircraft returns from its journey into the cloud. With the air crew still inside, the Canberras are marshaled into position in the decontamination area. This routine has been thoroughly rehearsed for minimum delay. When the aircraft has been declared safe for the ground staff to approach, the hatch is opened and protective covers are placed around the opening so that the crew can disembark without contamination. are then removed from the wingtip nacelles and placed in special containers. These will be taken over to a laboratory where they will be cut up into sections, some for analysis in the labs on the island, the remainder sealed in shielded containers. These are then taken to a Canberra aircraft standing by to take off. The samples are flown back to England for radiochemical analysis at Aldermaster. Helicopters carry re-entry personnel to Seaside for entry into the forward area. Fires are still burning in the vegetation. There weren't many fires, but some broke out, particularly where old leaves had piled up at the base of isolated trees. Light aluminium sheeting at forward camera positions was twisted and torn from the frame. Radiological measurements team are recovering records from containers in the instrument lane. D site, the nearest to the target area and the most heavily damaged position. These columns carried instruments which measured effects during the first few microseconds of the explosion. Note the sandblasted effect on the metal and the way this metal sheet has wrapped itself around a support. Behind the shelters at D site, this ventilating plant and generators suffered some damage. This generator was badly damaged and was thrown 30 feet from its original position. Sandbags used in the open as retaining walls and unprotected by cement washing have been burnt by the heat flash. Removing them is a worse job than putting them in place. In the JOC area, the radiochemical laboratory measures fission in the samples. Specimens are placed in a gridded iron chamber and pulses are analyzed by the pulse height analyzer. Group leaders must complete interim reports before leaving for home. The end of a trial is always a rush, reports to finish and equipment to store. Back in England, the data will be analysed and the results assessed to provide information vital to the continued progress of research and development.